Okay, so a few more people have joined us, so we'll go ahead and get, get started. So uh, today's webinar is uh, on the topic of raising ambitious ambition and improving integration. Um, and we'll be featuring key findings of the UN Global Compact 2019 progress report. So thank you so much for joining us. In the next slide, um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Claire Kells, I'm Senior Manager on the Outreach and Engagement Team at the UN Global Compact. Um, and my colleague, Sean Cruz, um, is joining today as well. Sean, would you like to say hello? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Sean Cruz. I'm the head of uh, technology and data here at the Global Compact, and I am the uh, individual I'm responsible for conducting our annual survey and um, uh, the project lead on the progress report, as well as our CEO study, which was uh, released earlier this year as well, uh, which was a, a joint project with Accenture Strategy. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. So, guests of our webinar, you have a real expert in-house. So um, in the next slide, um, you'll see, um, you know, please feel free to use the chat functionality or the Q&A functionality um, to type in your questions. We'll have a Q&A se session at the end. So please save questions. Um, and, you know, any questions about the data or the tools and resources we cover, you know, just type them in and we'll absolutely get to them during our Q&A session towards the end. So Let's go on and, and get started. Um, so I'm going to give a brief background on the UN Global Compact today uh, in the next slide. So the UN Global Compact is a special initi initiative of the UN Secretary General. Um, so we were founded in the year 2000 by then Secretary General Kofi Annan as a call on companies everywhere um, to align their strategy and operations um, with the universal values and norms of the United Nations as embodied in 10 universal principles of responsible business. Um, so with this mandate um, to guide and support um, global business community, we've now been mobilizing companies to take um, ambitious corporate level action on the sustainable development goals. And we're so proud to say that over the past 20 years, we've grown to more than 10,000 companies um, around the world we're represented in 160 countries globally um, with the close partnership of almost 70 local networks. So our country partners who bring alive the UN Global Compact in their national context. Um, and that uh, leaves us as the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world. Um, so we're really excited to share with you um, some of the data um, that we've collected through our annual survey from these, these companies and stakeholders. So next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about the annual survey in the next slide, and I think that's uh, over to Sean. So Sean, please tell us about your methodology. Yes, sure. Thanks, Claire. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a survey of all of the participants in the Global Compact. As Claire mentioned, we have nearly 10,000 participants. So. Um, each year we administer a survey to get to sort of a pulse check on um, where they stand with their efforts to implement against both the 10 principles um, and as well as efforts that they're taking uh, around the SDGs. Um, we also ask other general kind of questions on how they're managing sustainability within their organization, how it applies for, you know, for example, for the supply chain. Um, and we'll go into some of those data points um, during this presentation. So as a first step, just to show you who replies to the survey, um, the biggest uh, representative region in uh, the sample set is Europe. So we administer to the 10,000 companies and we get generally about a 25% response rate, which is good. Um, and if you look at the regional breakdown of the uh, representative of, of the representation there, what you find is that it actually is fairly uh, commensurate with the actual global compact database of uh, 10,000 participants. So seeing that Europe constitutes about half of the respondents is consistent with the fact that Europe constitutes about half of the uh, participants of the UN Global Compact as a whole. Fortunately, the Asia Pacific region, we get a pretty good representation uh, with 236 respondents. And so in this presentation, I'll be sharing some data, both at the global level, and then also looking at some 
collecting data specific to uh, the Asia Pacific region. Um, also, if you look at um, the breakdown of, of participants in terms of annual revenues, it's again kind of commensurate with what we see. There are a lot of about half of the participants uh, and respondents are uh, smaller companies under 25 million in annual revenue. And then also looking at the sector, industrial goods and services is, is highly represented than uh, technology as well. So this is uh, the breakdown of the 1,600 responses that we received. And then I should also say that through the presentation, will at times be referencing data from the CEO perspectives. And so the CEO study was uh, run in tandem. So the implementation survey is intended to get, like I said, a pulse check of you know, what companies are doing today. The CEO study, the CEO survey is slightly different in that it's aiming to get the perspectives of CEOs on where they see the world of corporate sustainability today and where they see it going in the future. So there's a bit more of like just the perspective of the CEO itself. And um, we received uh, about a thousand responses to that survey from a thousand CEOs. And uh, that research was supplemented by about a hundred interviews with CEOs themselves. So while this presentation will touch on some of these, uh, you know, uh, definitely findings from the progress report and some findings from the CEO study, we are arranged, we've arranged a, a dedicated webinar on the CEO study findings themselves, and that will be conducted uh, the first week of January, I believe it's January 7th. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit of the methodology there. And so, hey, Claire, I guess I can turn it back to you if you want to start talking about some of like the major, the key messages um, and key findings, and then I'm happy to dig into some of the details um, after that. Perfect, excellent. Yes, thank you, Sean. So yes, let's get started with some of the key findings. So I think the real headline here is, um, unfortunately, after four years um, of the sustainable development goals that were adopted in 2015, um, we are not on track. No country in the world is on track, um, and no SDG is on track to be met. So, um, we're still facing, um, you know, um, a lot of um, action and ambition that's needed um, from the from the corporate sector. Um, you know, that's what we mobilize here at the global compact level. But um, really, all sectors of society need to to take more action and take more ambitious action. So, you know, what this looks like, um, you know, beyond the headline is that we're still 202 years away from closing the economic gender gap globally at the current pace. Eight million tons of plastic enter the ocean every year. Um, in terms of the worst forms of labor exploitation, 150 million children are still in child labor around the world. And we are not on track to reduce global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, in fact, current data and the results of the COP25 conference show that we're on track to um, uh, about a three or a four degree um, pathway future. Um, and, you know, even life on land um, is under threat with um, biodiversity under threat um, from species extinction. So some, some serious threats face us. Um, but, um, you know, I think with, with this um, sort of grounding for us going forward, hopefully um, we can really motivate and guide companies on how to take action to, to um, speed up the pace of progress and change. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, and we're seeing in general with the SDGs um, that there is awareness and a commitment. Um, that's not really the, the challenge. I think we've been all pleasantly surprised um, that the SDGs are on the radar and especially on the radar of CEOs. And CEOs, of course, are very smart individuals and really appreciate the importance of these issues. And 88% of CEOs do agree that our global systems, um, you know, our financial systems, um, our trading systems, our supply chain sy systems, our governance systems, um, do need to be refocused um, to include equitable growth and growth that um, delivers for all. So I think awareness is there and it's at the highest level. And not only is awareness there um, at the CEO level in terms of the current business value, um, you know, the darker blue line here shows where CEOs see current business value in terms of um, their brand, um, you know, increasing the brand value, increasing revenue, um, helping with risk mitigation um, and, and cost savings. Um, but in terms of um, sustainability, creating value in the next 
five to 10 years, 99% of CEOs see the future of business value. So it's almost unanimous that sustainability is the future of business. So let's move on to the next slide. And in general, um, we are seeing some action from, from companies guided by their executives um, taking action on the global goal. So um, from the progress report of companies responding, you know, 81% of companies um, participating in the global compact are taking action on the sustainable development goals. And of those companies, 67% um, CEOs are really leading um, the agenda. So again, I think understanding awareness um, of, of the sustainable development goals and, and the, the challenges that they are designed to solve for uh, and that the vision of the world um, that they embody for our future for the year 2030 um, are very, I think, well incorporated into, into the thinking and, and the um, long-term thinking of CEOs and corporate level executives. But in the next slide, um, um, we'll see specifically in terms of uh, Asia Pacific, um, I think positively, 85% um, of companies in Asia Pacific are taking action, so that um, exceeds our, our global um, number. Um, and 64% of CEOs in Asia Pacific are leading on this agenda, so it's really um, great to see such uptake of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030 from the Asia Pacific region. So in the next slide, please. Um, we're also seeing that the, the, the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact are embedded at policy level. So that's sort of um, often the first starting point for companies in their sustainability journey. And their journey with the UN Global Compact is that they um, create um, and implement a policy on human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. Those are the core issue areas of the UN Global Compact, um, the, the essence of the 10 principles. And so companies are indeed um, uh, embedding the 10 principles at the policy level across these core issue areas um, pretty consistently. So that's, that's, that's there, that's in place, um, that first step and that foundation for a company's sustainability journey is there, which is great to see. In the next slide, um, indeed, at the Asia Pacific level, um, again, um, you know, just edging out some of our global numbers, which is great to see real uptake um, of this in the region, 94% um, on human rights, 93% on the environment, 96% on labor, 93% on anti-corruption. And then the next slide. But, but really um, what we're, we're seeing is that there's a gap between awareness and action. Um, so as I've just demonstrated from the data, um, the awareness, the interest, the, 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 the vision of the SDGs is there, Policy level is there, but only 70 um, and 71 percent of CEOs agree that business can play a critical role in contributing to the sustainable development goals. But only 21 percent think that they actually are having impact currently. Um, so there's a real gap in terms of translating policy uh, to action and impact. Um, and CEOs are aware of this. Executives are aware of this gap. In the next slide, please. Um, and I think here then we're gonna do a deep dive um, on some of the, the principles to really um, break down this, these headline numbers to show um, progress um, and areas that need more progress on the, on the 10 principles. And for that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sean, our, our data head. Great, thanks, Clara. Thanks for that, um, that great overview. And you're right, I mean, this is the story that the, is being told through the data is that, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, making a commitment and, and having the policies in place, you see high levels of implementation, you know, both globally and throughout uh, the regions. Um, but then when you start to kind of dig into some of the actual specific actions that we'd like to see companies taking, that's where you see, start to see these gaps manifest. So in terms of looking at the 10 principles, sort of broadly speaking, um, we, you know, suggest, you know, through our materials and through our, our work uh, with our companies that, you know, there's a few approaches that they can take in terms of um, 
implementing the 10 principles within their organization that are steps that are relevant across the 10 principles. So for example, in terms of conducting a risk and impact assessment within their organization on to what extent they have um, potential risk and impacts uh, on these particular areas. And we see that's generally kind of even globally, they're fairly low. It's uh, um, the only 38% of companies are conducting a general risk assessment, 29 uh, an impact. And we'll look at uh, I think this data a little bit more closely by the issues themselves. In terms of integration of the principles into like how companies are doing business, you do see like high rates where 61% are saying that they include uh, corporate responsibility expectations and relevant, let's say, procurement documents uh, to ensure that the vendors that they're utilizing are themselves also abiding by the 10 principles. Um, and the 50% are incorporating responsible purchasing practices into procurement training. But then when you look at, um, you know, uh, and requiring these, uh, this commitment to uh, 10 principles in the value chain, only 13% of companies are there. Um, they're exploring and we understand that that's hard and it's difficult, but, you know, that's the reality is that only 13% are requiring it at this time. Um, in terms of uh, measurement and how a company can kind of like better understand once they've been integrating uh, this uh, sustainability into how they do business. 50% are uh, consistently monitoring, uh, monitoring and evaluating performance when it comes to labor standards in the environment, uh, whereas anti-corruption and human rights are uh, relatively undermeasured in comparison. Um, and this is something we've seen fairly consistently and, you know, we have theories, but in some respects, it, it, it's generally sort of understood that maybe the environment because of carbon capture and disclosure is a bit more um, tangible and anti-corruption and human rights are sort of a bit more difficult to really uh, nail down in terms of measurement. Um, in terms of disclosure, 70% of companies indicate they have reported publicly to the overall sustainability performance, which is good and, and, and nice to see and also sort of understandable in the sense that um, as a global compact participant, uh, you know, one of the main or like one of the main requirements is that they publicly disclose annually their efforts to implement against the 10 principles. Um, and then when asked if uh, they're communicating uh, information about the sustainability efforts internally, 66% say they do so, which is, which is good. So I'm going to just walk through um, uh, looking specifically at the, each of the different principal areas. So we'll start with human rights. And as you can start seeing sort of the same story where, you know, um, workplace health and safety, non-discrimination, gender equality, these are highly addressed in policies uh, within the organization. But then less than half of 41% even um, uh, are integrating or uh, addressing a ensuring that their employees have an adequate standard of living um, which is a fundamental human right and I think it's important for companies to recognize that that should really be a part of how they are doing business and you know what's good on this front is that you know globally uh, we've been uh, offering a decent work action platform to really help address this uh, itself Claire would you like to uh, talk at all about uh, the what the decent work action platform is kind of focusing on in this area? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so our uh, action platforms, our global working groups, um, uh, run on different topics related to the sustainable development goals. And we've had one on decent work in global supply chain for um, a year or two now. And um, they will be launching in um, February an uh, uh, engagement toolkit for responsible procurement. So it's a toolkit for procurement officers and procurement teams to use in terms of engaging suppliers and other colleagues um, at the corporate level around um, sustainability and how that can be embedded into the supply chain. But not only that, um, I think um, you know, what's uh, important to note is that um, not only does this data show where more action is needed at the corporate level, in order to um, you know, evolve our own programs in order to help companies um, take action in these areas that we're identifying. Um, we also respond in terms of our programming to the data we're seeing here. So um, that Decent Work in Global Supply Chain action platform um, will be um, uh, pivoting towards um, tackling working poverty in 2020. So for companies that really want to 
um, tackle this issue, um, you know, in their supply chain, um, but also in their, you know, direct operations. Um, that action platform is really going to be identifying leading practices for companies um, that want to take action on tackling working poverty in 2020 and beyond. So that looks like that's going to be a really um, impactful area of programming. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. Yeah. And so, what you know, kind of while we're on the topic of these uh, labor issues, we should also take a look at uh, aspects of labor rights that are being addressed in company policies. And, you know, kind of similar on the previous slide, you see the high rates of uh, uh, ensuring that non-discrimination and safe working conditions are addressed. And fortunately, I mean, there's less, but still uh, the majority are addressing some of, of these difficult issues of ensuring there's no child labor, or no forced labor uh, utilized through their operations and in their uh, supply chain. So from here, um, let's take a look at some of the types of activities, um, you know, specific to actually looking at uh, addressing sustainability in the organization and um, through the supply chain. And you see, in when you're looking at human rights and labor, um, you know, about half or less than half on human rights with more than half on labor have uh, training and awareness programs for employees. Uh, Yet there's, you know, it's still um, in terms of human rights and labor, less so are implementing these impact assessments that I touched on earlier in terms of like the general impact assessment on sustainability. But when you look and dig into like the specific issue areas is even less so with only 15% of companies are, are, are doing so. And this is also an area where we, you know, put a lot of work because we think that this is important for companies to ensure that they understand the impact that they are having on the human rights of their employees, the communities, and where they operate. And then also what you're seeing is that in the supply chain and some subcontracting arrangements, like when it comes to human rights and labor, it's only a quarter of companies are, are really doing so. Um, so in, in this area, also monitoring and evaluating, uh, at least when it comes to labor, it's almost about half of companies, whereas human rights, again, less so. Um, and when it comes to all of this, I mean, we do also offer um, opportunities for companies to generally like benefit um, specifically like when it comes to training and awareness. Um, I don't know, Claire, do you want to talk uh, briefly about like the Academy, for example? Because the Academy that we launched a couple of years ago has a lot of good uh, resources that can kind of help companies in these exact areas of operations. Exactly. Um, I always love an opportunity to, to showcase the Academy. So <laughs> the Academy is the UN Global Compact online learning platform. Um, and it is chock full of modules, um, so learning modules um, that are available live or on demand. Um, and they're available to any employee um, at a company that is engaging with the UN Global Compact at the participant level. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, please reach out to um, one of us and we'll share our contact information at the end. But the Academy is exactly designed to coach um, and train and build a knowledge, practical knowledge and skills around sustainability and issues um, for employees at companies, um, including human rights and labor, but environment and anti-corruption um, as well. And actually, I wanted to point out also that in the area of impact assessments, especially in human rights impact assessments, um, we have a, a tool for companies called how to develop a human rights policy. And part of it includes implementing a human rights policy, which is indeed an impact assessment, as well as um, one of those academy sessions is on um, how to conduct a human rights impact assessment. So if any of these areas are also sort of challenges or pain points for your company, um, the Global Compact very likely um, and by design has programming and content to help you. So um, please definitely reach out and we'll connect you to those, those tools and resources. So thank you, Sean. Oh yeah, no, great. That's awesome. Thanks, Claire. Uh, yeah, I just um, uh, just to point out, I uh, while Claire was giving you an overview of the academy and the other offerings, we just advanced the slide because uh, just to show the regional data for the same data points on training, impact, supply chain, and monitoring and evaluation for the Asia Pacific. Um, so you can see, um, in, you know, in comparison, there are in most areas you're seeing higher rates of implementation in Asia Pacific compared to global, um, which is good to see. Then on the next slide. Now, um, the tenth principle on anti-corruption is, you know, very uh, core or needs to be core to how 
companies do business. I mean, if at the end of the day, despite efforts to like contribute to the SDGs and, and other goals, if they're operating so in a curb up manner, then it really undermines those efforts. So um, unfortunately, when we're comparing to last year's data, we saw kind of a drop in the number of companies that have specific anti-corruption codes or addressing corruption within an overall corporate code and also on companies that have zero tolerance policies. So, you know, we think that this is an important area for us to continue to really emphasize how critical it is. Um, and in terms of like actions, you see that, you know, there are trainings that are being undertaken, but then less so in terms of impact assessment and supply chain um, and monitoring and evaluating. Um, so again, this is an area that we think is really important. and. And Claire, there's a, a like a framework on anti-corruption that we've I think have come out with. Is that right? Exactly. So it's called Business Against Corruption: A Framework for Action. Um, so it again it, it provides some some management steps and some governance steps that companies can can take to really embed um, you know anti-corruption um, management practices into their their strategy and operation. So that's called Business Against Corruption. A framework for action and it's available on our smart library on our website great okay thanks for that um, so moving along um, we can uh, take a look at um, the data around uh, the global goals and one thing to point out and this is not coming from our research but from research of others particularly the Danish Institute for Human Rights they um, conducted an, an analysis of the targets, the 169 uh, SDG targets, and determined that 92% of those targets are in some way linked to international human rights instruments. So to us, I mean, the link of the human rights and the principles themselves um, are really core and underpin how we you know advise companies to make contributions to the goals themselves is to do so in a principle-based manner that means by ensuring that the company is upholding the 10 principles right there and then in and of itself they're already making a major contribution um, to to advancing the goals themselves because the, the principles are are inherent and underpin um, uh, underpin them all really um, Claire, do you want to add anything before we move to the data? Or um, I think um, just to reiterate that that key point that um, you know human rights and principle based um, business really underpin the all of the sustainable development goals. Um, and, and in fact, in uh, the Agenda 2030, which is the document that um, formalized um, the SDGs, um, paragraph 67 really calls out um, that business should. Um, uphold universal standards and principles, um, you know, in their strategy and operations. So, um, in the foundation of the sustainable development goals is the call for business to, to you know, uphold these these principles and these standards throughout their operations. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Claire. Yeah, that's that's a very important point. Um, so, yeah. So, moving on. So, let's take a look at what uh, goals companies are uh, saying that they're taking action to contribute to. And so, you see globally, um, the top three are decent work and economic growth with 66% of companies, gender equality, 61%, and then good health and well-being at 60. Um, um, and then you see already kind of a bit of a drop off to the uh, goals 12, 13, 19, where, where it's all about 50% of companies. But then what we're also seeing that in a way it's, it gets a little troubling, but it's, you see that only 13% of companies are addressing life below water, 20% zero hunger, 20% life on land. And so what we do find is that I think companies see some goals as more relevant to how and where they operate and um, their industry as well. Um, and that's, that's fine because we do advise companies to do like a responsible prioritization of what goals are most uh, relevant and where they can have the most impact. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that there is an interconnected uh, interconnectivity between the goals. So, you know, contribution to one goal here can have positive knockoff effects on how um, you're addressing or you're in maybe inadvertently or whatever addressing another goal. So it's important to uh, keep the narrative that 
they're all interconnected, but companies should be conducting a responsible prioritization of what goals are the most relevant to them. Um, we should say that 81% of companies are reporting to take some action to support their goals, and then you just can dive in and see the specifics of which ones they are contributing to. And 59% have reported that they see the SDGs as a guiding ambition framework to identify social and environmental opportunities. So let's look at what this data, uh, uh, look, let's look at this data for Asia Pacific. Um, it's interesting because when you look regionally, it's the same top three. Uh, it's just in a slightly different order. So uh, the 74% in Asia Pacific are addressing good health and well-being, 66% decent work and economic growth, and 64 gender equality. So it's just, again, the same top three, and actually higher rates of implementation. The 74% um, far outpaces 60% um, um, global. Um, and in Asia Pacific, 85% of companies are reporting to take actions that they are supporting the goals. Um, and then if you look at the goals that are less implemented in the region, you can find again life below water um, uh, as the lowest, but then you also are seeing peace, justice, and strong institutions, or only 30% of companies, and zero hunger is also toward the bottom where it's at 31%. Hey, Sean, can I give a, a shout out to two more of our action platforms? Oh, please do, Clara, yes. So um, specifically on life below water, um, given that that was sort of one of the goals that the fewest companies were taking action on, we have an action platform, again, one of those global working groups on oceans and sustainable oceans business. Um, and they um, uh, sort of launched six principles that companies that work in the oceans should adopt um, and so that can help really mitigate some of the, the impacts that companies have in the oceans, but also be a way to start taking action on that life below water goal. And as well, we have um, a peace, justice, and strong institutions action platform um, that's doing some great work to, to um, you know, really activate companies um, around working with, um, uh, you know, governments to create these, these strong institutions that really help um, bring alive human rights for all of us around the world. So. Our working groups are working on some great issues and we encourage companies to get involved in those. Cool. All right. Thanks, Claire. Um, so looking at um, some of the actions that companies are taking to advance the goals, um, one of the number one uh, uh, activities that companies or actions that companies indicate is by upholding the 10 principles of the global compact itself, which is great because that's very aligned with our narrative around ensuring that companies take a principle-based approach to how they're addressing the SDGs. But one of the things that you see is that when you're diving a little bit deeper, this is where companies are either sort of struggling or have less action in place in terms of things like developing products and services that contribute to the goals, only 39%, or aligning their core business strategies with the goals, only 35 um, Also, um, you know, in terms of like companies setting corporate goals that are sufficiently ambitious, science-based, or aligned with societal needs, we're only seeing 25% of companies doing so. Um, and the thing is that this is, you know, we, you know, we started the presentation off by, you know, explaining that we're seeing that um, there's not, there has been some action, but it's not enough. And, you know, the world's not on track. And, you know, to get us back on track, I mean, this is, I think, the area that we really, you know, would we need to see more um, companies kind of stepping up and setting these, like, ambitious science-based uh, goals um, to contribute um, uh, towards societal needs and, you know, taking efforts to where possible, like, design business models that contribute to the goals, align core business strategy, and so forth. Um, and so the thing is, I mean, it's feasible. It, it can happen. Um, Ambitious action, um, you know, I uh, don't know, uh, in case you missed this year, uh, we asked companies uh, to take a science base to align their um, uh, goals uh, around climate uh, emissions um, to the 1.5 aligned science base um, scenario. And we launched that um, earlier this year, and I've already had 177 companies 
agree uh, to, to take that on. Um, so it can be done, and there's 177 companies, you represent 2.8 trillion market cap, 5.8 million employees and 36 countries. So these companies are taking this commitment seriously and aligning um, their carbon emissions targets with the 1.5 uh, future scenario. Claire, would you like to add anything on the uh, 1.5 campaign? Yeah, I think another great example of um, ambitious action we're seeing evolve um, around water. Um, so I think you know climate and water are really interlinked, um, and this idea of a science-based, um, rigorous framework that companies can can use to set you know the appropriate level of ambitious corporate action. You know that's worked really well for climate, um, as we see here. And I think what we're seeing is that the the next um, sort of resource um, that will will have a framework like this is water. So. Um, right now it's called, or sort of the concept is called context-based uh, water targets. So it's a way for companies to, um, uh, you know, work within a particular watershed um, and use, you know, rigorous scientific data about that watershed to set corporate level goals for water management that will have the appropriate and ambitious level of action to have positive impact on that watershed. Um, so that's being run through um, our water action platform, um, also um, sometimes known as the CEO water mandate. So for companies that really want to take um, ambitious action and leading action on, on water, we encourage them to get involved in, in that working group. Great, thanks Claire. Um, so yeah, so just the last um, slide on the data, um, um, and I should say, and I, this is going to come up again later in the presentation, there's, there's more data, but uh, we're just kind of showing sort of the main highlights, especially as it comes to the principles and mm -hmm. SDGs, uh, but there was more asked, um, which, you know, will surface in other reports um, uh, throughout the year. Um, so in terms of like what where companies are challenged, because that's the thing, it's a, you know, we're, we recognize that it's hard. And so, you know, that's why, you know, we have so many opportunities and engagements to really just help companies to, to be able to advance this agenda. So when we are asking companies where their challenges lie, it's the larger companies that say that extending the strategy throughout the supply chain and implementing the strategy across business functions are the biggest challenges. And it's about 50% or less than 50% for each of those, but that is of the largest companies like the biggest challenge. Whereas when you ask the smaller companies, um, their biggest challenge remains in a lack of financial resources in order to advance the agenda. Um, and one thing to point out that's interesting is this uh, one at the bottom where it's like no clear link to business value. We've found that this has continued to drop over the last um, five years. So, I mean, only less than a quarter of companies um, are claiming that they don't see a link to business value. So, and more and more companies are saying that they do so. Um, so this we uh, see as a, a positive development. So with that, I mean, Claire, I, maybe I can hand it back to you and, you know, based on kind of what we we found in the data this year and seeing, you know, talk to like what we see as the way forward for the Global Compact and its participants. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Um, that was a great, um, you know, high level um, look at the data from the expert on the data himself. So thank you for that. So let's no move problem. forward to Happy the to do next. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's move forward to the next slide. So I think the real key takeaway here um, is that, um, you know, the, the, the awareness and the interest and the understanding of the sustainable development goals and the understanding of the potential um, is there, but companies aren't taking enough action and it's not ambitious enough. So what our call to companies is, is to set more ambitious corporate level goals that are aligned with societal and environmental needs. So what this 25% um, is, is that currently only 25%, so one in four companies, are setting corporate level goals that are ambitious enough. So more companies need to set um, and commit to something like the 1.5 degree science-based target or something like a context-based water target. So more companies need to do this. And only 35% 35% of companies are aligning strategy with the SDG, SDGs and integrating that fully across business functions and supply chain. So more companies need to take action um, to really integrate and embed and push um, uh, sustainability and the SDGs 
you know, throughout corporate functions, so beyond the sustainability team and, and beyond just a direct operations, to, to supply chain, to suppliers, beyond tier one, beyond tier two, to really, um, you know, reach everyone where that they, they have impact. So more action and more ambitious action. That's the takeaway. So um, let's, let's put some fine detail on that and we'll go on to the, the next slide. So as I mentioned um, in the beginning, that our programming is really guided by some of this data so that we're, we're um, you know, one of the big um, uh, undertakings that we started in 2019 and are really rolling out um, starting in 2020 are what we call global impact initiatives. And these are designed to be um, accelerators and like action labs for companies um, to really take action on, on some of these issues that we've identified. So. Um, one that we launched um, already in September and is underway uh, in, I think, um, 10 or 11 local networks or country markets around the world is Young SDG Innovators. It's, it's super exciting. It's a classic innovation um, accelerator, and young professionals um, are, par are participating in this accelerator to learn how to drive innovation within their company using the Sustainable Development Goals as a lens really cool and exciting and i think we're very excited to see the outcomes of, of this first round in june 2020 at our, our flagship event um, we also announced um, in september and we'll be launching in early 2020 target gender equality so again to help companies um, set um, ambitious corporate level goals on gender equality you know from the top to the bottom so from leadership all the way to supply chain um, make that commitment and then help them figure out how to bring that alive um, SDG Ambition, um, we're super excited about that. We're going to be um, announcing and launching that at the World Economic Forum in January, so definitely stay tuned. That's coming up soon. Um, and this is really looking at um, this, this real core issue of how to mainstream the 10 principles and the SDGs into strategy, operations, and stakeholder engagement, so really across um, corporate functions and roles, so beyond the sustainability team. And then um, target climate um, 1.5 degrees. So um, again, helping companies um, make that commitment and then how they can bring that alive and, and you know, bringing in learnings from companies who have already made that commitment and sharing those learnings so that other companies can, can learn and we can really accelerate um, action. So these um, impact initiatives, um, we're rolling them out. So please stay tuned. You can sign up for our monthly bulletin, you know, check our website or check in with us and really get connected to these um, exciting um, accelerator programs that we're running um, in close collaboration and partnership with our local networks around the world. So in the next slide, this is an example um, of what we mean when we say integrating SDGs and 10 principles across corporate functions. So um, this is a little bit of a snapshot of some of the work of that SDG ambition um, impact initiative. Um, so this is really embedding sustainability um, you know, throughout all of these different roles um, you know, across the company. Um, and just as a quick example, um, in terms of, um, you know, corporate finance, we're also launching, um, I think actually this week, it might even be, have been today in Milan, um, a CFO task force. Um, so really activating, you know, finance um, leaders and finance teams within companies to, to um, raise and deploy capital for sustainable, you know, with sustainability as a main objective. Um, and we've also recently launched um, a guide to uh, general counsel on sustainability version 2.0. So again, engaging your, your legal teams, um, corporate legal teams and general counsel to um, really embed sustainability in, in their work. So that will be taken forward um, in the SDG ambition impact initiative. So if you wanna, you know, as a sustainability professional, really engage your colleagues and your entire corporate um, enterprise, this is the um, impact initiative for you. So really looking forward to seeing how that um, evolves and it's going to be some great work there. In the next slide. Um, some other ways to engage. I've already touched on the Academy learning platform, our online learning platform. Um, again, it's um, you know, just full of really um, top-notch um, learning modules, um, live and on demand on a range of sustainability topics, including of much of what we've covered today. Um, and our action platforms, those are those global working groups that I mentioned. So we have one on sustainable ocean business, peace, justice, strong institutions. I mentioned decent work in global supply chains, transitioning into tackling working poverty. Um, we've got one on climate. So really 
um, those working groups are identifying thought leadership and working with leading companies um, to really um, you know, develop that thought leadership and, and what um, leading business practice is so that we can take it forward um, and mainstream it through other programming like the Academy uh, and like the Impact Initiative. Um, and then the next slide, please. Um, Shauna, did you want to make a note about any additional findings um, from the progress report? There's so much data there to share with companies. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot. Um, so, um, yeah, so the progress report is available online uh, in our uh, smart library. And it is a, it's a pretty massive document. It has a, a section where we go like SDG by SDG. And we have some like key highlights of kind of what, um, what we're seeing in 2019, as well as some examples of ways that companies are contributing to the goals. Um, and also too, I mean, the, we have the data where we can cut it by region, as you've seen in this presentation, and by sector, by company size as well. And then also I should say that the, um, the sort of an annex to the progress report is, a, um, is an overview of some key activities that are local uh, networks um, in about, I think it's like somewhere between like 40 to 50 different examples of uh, actions and activities that networks have had underway uh, in uh, over the past year. So it gives you a good flavor uh, for the type of work that the networks do and, 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 and that. Um, should also say in the next slide, the additional resources. I mean, you know, so I mentioned we'll do a presentation on another webinar the first week of January, January 7th, on the CEO study. So you see the progress report in the CEO study there to the left. And then we also just highlighted a couple other key resources that were, were released this year. Um, you know, one that uh, goes into there's a 1.5 degree Celsius campaign that we were talking about earlier, um, one on climate and health, and then also a resource that uh, does a deep dive on um, navigating the future of business and human rights, uh, all of which is available in our library. Um, Claire, would you like to let, add anything there or? Um, no, I think just uh, directing people to our smart library, a lot of this is available. Um, and, you know, if you have specific questions about, oh, you mentioned one resource, you know, don't hesitate to, to contact us and we'll connect you to that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. All right. Sounds good. Um, so, yeah, I guess with that, then um, I, see, I see we did have a few questions come in. Um, so let's, uh, you know, uh, if you have any questions, again, as Claire showed at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the Q&A um, button uh, in the uh, webinar view uh, will be a way to get those questions to us. Um, so if you just give me a minute on just looking at some of these questions for the first time. Um, there's a question of whether we'll have some reports in Chinese later. Um, I think that's the goal. Um, I think for 2020 when we do the reports again this year is to make more available in, uh, in Chinese and Mandarin. Um, like, Claire? Uh, actually, uh, Shania, I can jump in there. Um, we're actually running this webinar in Mandarin tomorrow. Um, so um, I think it'll be around this same time, um, but it will be run in Mandarin in collaboration with our local network um, in China. So I think for this person, um, um, you know, we'll, we'll connect with you um, post uh, webinar and make sure we get you that registration link so you can sign up to, to listen to this in, in, in Mandarin. Um, very soon, and then of course the recording for that will be available. Um, you know, if anyone is, is unable to to join that webinar, so that's coming right up. Okay, good timing. Um, the, uh, I have a question about whether the CEOs surveyed are limited to those of companies that are signatories of the UNGC. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we just survey from our own um, set of, of of companies that have joined. Um, you know, we have mulled in the past the idea of trying to, you know, potentially compare what our global compact companies are saying to companies outside of the initiative. Um, and so, you know, we're still looking for like the right research program to get at that. But for now, um, all the data that in these reports are coming from companies that have joined the initiative. Um, so, hey, uh, so Claire, uh, there's a question here that maybe you could speak to. Uh, Eugene? Yeah is uh, asking what's the relationship between global impact initiatives and action platforms? Oh, that's a great, uh, great answer. So 
Um, Action Platform, um, it's, it's global programming that we run out of our headquarters, um, you know, primarily based in, here in New York. Um, those colleagues run the Action Platform. And that's where we develop thought leadership and really identify leading practices um, from business on a particular issue area. Um, so companies that, um, you know, want to understand what those leading trends are, are or are um, implementing some of those leading trends, they participate in those action platforms. Now, the Global Impact Initiative, that's how we mainstream those leading business practices, right? Because it's great to have leading business practices, but if only a small handful of companies are um, adopting those practices, then they won't really have the impact that the world needs. So those impact initiatives, um, they are run by our local networks, our um, country chapters, our country partners. Um, so they are run around the world. Um, and you know, we, we are aiming to um, engage you know, over a thousand companies in those impact initiatives. And that really brings those leading practices to mainstream business. So um, you know, if your company um, you know, has heard about, oh wow, this 1.5 degree campaign, that's really cool, I think we can do that. The Global Impact Initiative would be a good way to really um, figure out how to make that work for your company. So it's really about action platforms um, is where we develop thought leadership and, and impact initiatives is where we kind of help companies then take action and mainstream um, those leading business practices. Great. Thanks for that, Claire. Um, I have another question from Aria, who's asking, uh, who's still a little unclear about the messaging around the, um, the uh, gap between awareness and action. Um, so basically, that I think you're referring specifically to the slide where we say that so is it 71% of company of CEOs. Um, think that business can have an impact on the on the goals, but only 21% think that they currently are doing so. So, I mean, what that means is that companies see that the private sector is an important part of being able to achieve this, uh, the sustainable development goals. But from the CEO's perspective, they feel that not enough companies in their industry, not enough companies in their geography are, are doing their part to contribute to the agenda. So I think it's, it's just an insight from CEOs where they feel that, you know, maybe they themselves as an engaged CEO in the compact are sees uh, that business can have a role to play, but uh, they just feel that they're they're not seeing enough effort from their peers is how we're interpreting that slide. Okay, what else? Um, uh, Claire, there's a question. Are academy materials only available to signatories of the UNGC? Ah, good question. Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, and in fact, academy materials are um, available to companies that are participants of the Global Compact. Um, so we actually have um, two levels of engagement for companies, participant and signatory. And so for participants, um, they have access to the academy um, in full. Um, a few of the academy sessions are available um, uh, to all um, publicly and we call those um, influencer series and we do maybe you know a ha small handful of those a year with real thought leaders um, for example um, with the Secretary General Special Envoy on Climate something like that but in general the majority of um, Academy content is available to Global Compact participants but if um, any companies are interested in learning more about becoming a participant happy to talk to them about that for sure. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, there's a question uh, from an anonymous attendee about uh, any information we have available on how organizations are embedding the global goals into their strategies and operations. And it would be good to see case studies if they're available. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can start, Claire, if you want, but uh, I'd say if you look across the resources that we have in our smart library, many of them, um, including the progress report, like feature examples of what 
uh, how, what, how companies are embedding the uh, global goals into their strategies and operations. Um, sometimes, I mean, it may be uh, action that seems maybe it's more like philanthropic, but there are definitely many cases of companies that are, are integrating it into the how they do business. Um, and then there's many other resources that maybe are focused specifically on one aspect of sustainability, like human rights or anti-corruption. That also will include case examples. It's, uh, uh, I think it's just a matter of kind of exploring through the materials we have in the library. Claire, would you add anything to that or? Mm, yeah, I might highlight a few tools and resources, but I agree, um, you're right, you're spot on, Sean, that um, case studies are you know, included in, in many of our tools and resources, um, but I'll, um, you know, encourage um, this person to check out our SDG compass um, and then also our blueprint for SDG leadership. So those give good examples of what um, corporate action on, for each SDG can look like, what are the sort of key themes for a business, um, and then also that SDG ambition impact initiative I mentioned, that will be um, sort of going forward our key, um, uh, you know, uh, programming elements. Um, where we'll be helping companies figure out how to sort of, you know, what it looks like to take action on, on the SDGs. Great. Okay, so I'm being notified that we only have time for one more question. Uh, and so don't worry, if your question hasn't been addressed on the line, uh, we have a record of it. And so we'll be able to reach out and um, also you'll see our contact information on the next slide. Uh, but so let's see, there's a couple questions about engagement, Claire. Um, so I'll actually, I'll give you a bonus. I'll give you two for the price of one. One uh, company wants to know how to become a participant rather than a signatory. And then another uh, wants to know how to get involved with the context based water target working group great um, so becoming a participant if your company is already a signatory <clears throat> reach out to your participant engagement manager um, and let them know you'd like to to sort of upgrade and we'll we'll make that happen for you um, that's totally possible and um, if you're not already a participant of the global compact you know, join um, and join as a participant um, and again, you know, if you have specific detailed questions about how to do any of that, you know, just reach out to anyone on the participant engagement team. And um, I hope we're sharing our, yeah, there's our um, contact information. Um, and then in terms of context-based water targets. So that's um, through our water stewardship working group um, and the CEO water mandate. So for companies participating in the global compact, that's a working group that they can join. Um, there is information about it on the website if you um, search for CEO water mandate and water stewardship that should come up um, but again feel free to reach out to either Sean or I and we'll get you connected to to that team great so again thank you everyone for your time for joining today and your interest um, and yeah we're happy to be in touch if you have any further questions or if your question wasn't answered uh, today uh, but again um, have a great day and um, we're signing off here from the global compact great thanks right. bye bye, -bye. thanks